Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Ray. I work for Red Hat. And joining me today is my colleague, Daniel Alvarez, who also works for Red Hat. And the topic of this presentation is Layer 3 Networking with Border Gateway Protocol in Hyperscale Data Centers. So this is the agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about data centers and how they've evolved over the last number of years. We're going to introduce the Border Gateway Protocol. And then we're going to talk about the community interest in integrating layer three routing protocols like the Border Gateway Protocol into our products, OpenStack and OpenShift. Then we'll wrap up with a brief discussion about future activities and take any questions from the audience. So I don't want to overgeneralize data centers. Obviously, every data center is designed slightly differently. However, uh, we do want to talk a little bit about how data centers have evolved over the last couple of years. And this table is meant to highlight that. So in terms of network to topology, uh, traditional data centers would have had networking uh, arranged in a kind of a hierarchical manner, um, like an upside down tree. And that has changed over the last number of years to a more leaf and spine type model. And the reason for that is to do with scalability and it's ensuring the ability to scale the physical topology of the data center as required. Uh, the unit of compute has also changed in the data center, whereas previously we would have been deploying our workloads and applications in over-provisioned servers within a rack in the data center. And now, obviously, our applications are hosted in containers and virtual machines. And um, as such, the density of IP addresses within a rack has increased quite dramatically. Also, uh, the mobility of those IP addresses has also changed. Uh, again, whereas previously an IP address would have been associated to a server within the rack, and now we have IP addresses associated with virtual machines that can be uh, moved throughout the data center, and also IP addresses associated containers which can be brought up or destroyed quite quickly. Um, the way we build our applications is different. Um, previously, we would have been building big monolithic uh, applications hosted on a server, and the predominant network traffic pattern would have been north-south, so from a client outside the data center into the data center. Whereas now our applications are built uh, in a distributed manner, um, and as a result, there's a lot more traffic between uh, services within your application uh, east-west within the data center. Again, try not to overgeneralize, but typically the layer three smarts of a data, data center would be in the upper layers of the topology in the big core routing infrastructure. And the lower layers of the data center network topology would have been more uh, layer two focused. Uh, so that means uh, for layer two networks, uh, the way MAC addresses and IP addresses are uh, discovered within the network is through broadcast technology, things like ARP and Mac learning. Uh, other types of net, oh, layer two networking technology is also used uh, in this type of uh, data center. Um, so things like spanning tree protocol to ensuring there's no loops in the networks, uh, VLANs for segmenting the, the, the network segments, and then various technologies for ensuring redundancy of uh, network links. And, and these have all served us very well over the years, but uh, they do present some challenges in the type of data center that I talked about in the previous slide with a large number of IP addresses that move around a lot and a lot of east-west traffic. Um, so some of the, those challenges are listed here on the left. So as we have a lot more IP addresses um, in and MAC addresses within a, in a rack, uh, the top of rack switch has a lot of extra pressure on its forwarding tables because it needs to learn and store the, um, you know, the MAC addresses to uh, these applications in its, in its tables, in its TCAMs. And as a result, the number of TCAM entries has increased uh, quite dramatically, uh, even uh, greater than what's available in some top of rack switches. Also, because we're using broadcasting, um, you know, ARPs and MAC learning to, to discover uh, MAC addresses for IP addresses, uh, the convergence time when things change in the network has increased as well. Uh, it can take a long time um, when an IP address moves from one location to another location for all the various tables uh, to update accordingly. Um, and as the, the size of our 
layer two segments is quite is you know larger as a result of that our broadcast domain is a lot larger so there's far more no nodes on the layer two network which means there's far more uh, broadcast traffic and also our failure layer two failure failure domain is large as well so all these problems are presented um in lar layer two networks when you scale them up to hyperscale and there's various ways you can resolve this. Uh, however, one trend that we are seeing is the use of layer three throughout the data center. Uh, so in a layer three data center, rather than have the, the routing smarts located at the you know, top of the topology in the core router, uh, we actually see those, routings, those, those smarts distributed throughout the data center, even down to the servers themselves in the racks. And as a result, you need some way to distribute those routes around the data center. So there's various routing protocols. And the one we're going to talk about today in this presentation is Border Gateway Protocol. And uh, as well, there's other analogous uh, technologies needed in a layer three data center for things like redundancy, um, uh, you know, link failure detection. So things like bidirectional forward detection and, detection and ECMP. And this does resolve some of the issues that we talked about in the previous time. In the literature, you do see uh, people quoting convergence times of less than a millisecond. And obviously, you can see how the L2 failure domains and the broadcast domains start to shrink accordingly as you distribute your L3 routing smarts throughout the data center. So as I mentioned here, um, there are a number of, of, of routing protocols that you could potentially use for this. However, the one that we're going to discuss here is the border gateway protocol. So what is a border gateway protocol? Some people may be familiar with it because it is the uh, protocol, protocol, routing protocol used um, on the internet for exchanging routes. Uh, BGP is a routing protocol that allows you to exchange uh, reachability and routing information between autonomous systems on the internet. And uh, autonomous system basically is a collection of IP routing prefixes, prefixes that is under the control of a single administrative entity. So in the public internet, an administrative, uh, an autom autonomous system may be a service provider or a large enterprise organization. Um, you can also use ASs uh, within your own network as well uh, to um, segment your IP address space. And what BGP basically is, is a, is a control plane protocol that distributes these routes um, uh, amongst, uh, between autonomous systems um, using TCP port 179. Uh, there are two flavors of BGP. So there's interior BGP and exterior BGP. Interior BGP is used for exchanging routes within an autonomous system. And exterior BGP is uh, used for distributing routes between autonomous systems. Uh, so now I'm going to hand you over to Daniel Alvarez, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the community interest in integrating layer three protocols such as BGP into our products. Thank you, Mark. First, a quick introduction from my end. This is Daniel Alvarez. I've been working with Red Hat for the past four and a half years or so. And my main focus has been OpenStack networking and later on OVN, OBS. And I'm taking over from now with this slide, uh, which tries to capture the most recent and relevant community interest around the subject, where I have included a couple of uh, mailing list discussions uh, in, in OpenStack and also OBS and OBN, some specs that have been proposed for uh, OpenShift and uh, probably the most um, recent one is the one that happened uh, one month ago during the OBS and OVN conference 2020 back in December about OVN with dynamic routing which included a presentation by Nutanix where uh, eVPN based solution was presented. So this has attracted the interest of the community and, and the goal with this is for us to have a clearer idea of what is the community trying to solve and how they're trying to do it so that we can you know, help through the suite or through our suite of products to to achieve this. In this slide, I'm going to go over the main use cases in OpenStack. Um, summarizing, there's three main pillars. The the first one would be advertising host routes either slash thirty two or slash one twenty eight for IPv six to the actual VMs on provider networks. A second one would be to advertise tenant networks. I will go through it a little bit later. 
and then advertising flowed in IPs uh, for the IPv4 use case. There is currently an existing project upstream called Neutron Dynamic Routing that covers pretty much this, but it lacks an important uh, feature, which is the uh, advertisement of host routes to uh, virtual machines on, on provider networks. So it does only support tenant networks advertisement, and it only advertises the whole subnet. So it you know it, it will advertise uh, slash twenty four slash twenty six or whatever subnetting you may have through the Neutron virtual router. So the next hub of of that subnet will be always the Neutron Neutron gateway port. So this um, is not supporting provider networks, as I said, and um, there is a few more uh, cuts to this. Like for now, even its architecture is pluggable and it supports uh, to add any uh, backends that you may want. The current reference implementation is a simple Python BGP speaker implementation which we don't believe it's production grade. We haven't seen many real world use cases for this project. So we are uh, considering whether it's worth to, to try to revive it or implement a backend, reuse the API up to some extent. And uh, this is merely what we are today. And with this in mind, I'm going to move to the next slide. Uh, a little bit walkthrough of what we had in mind for um, what a design for OpenStack would look like. Uh, keep in mind that this design, when we initially um, worked on it, basically it's just architectural work. What we have done um, is to be reused by OpenShift as much as we can. And uh, this is why, you know, by, by having OVN as a common networking layer for both uh, the thing that would make more sense here would be to use a OV, an, an OVN daemon, which you know naturally mon monitors the OVN southbound DB, which includes information about the workloads, where do they reside, and so on and so forth. And doing some configuration dynamically in the host uh, to advertise uh, this route. So in a nutshell, what we are trying to do here without any modifications of OVN or, or OpenStack would be to run this OVN daemon on each hypervisor or on each compute node and uh, configure the, uh, on a dummy interface, configure the IP addresses of all the VMs that boot on that, on that VM, on that hypervisor. Uh, this will trigger whatever route dynamic routing solution, which we are aiming to use FRR. So this will trigger FRR to advertise to the BGP peer the routes, directly connected routes to those VMs. And uh, we are assuming absolutely no layer two connectivity outside the rack. So in the first approach, what we are aiming to is to having two NICs using ECMP routes to the top of racks and those top of rack those networks would be slash 31, um, you know, basically point to point networks to the top of rack just for the BGP sessions and um, to steer all the traffic to that network. So the goal um, is to advertise those VMs that are going to be put it on, on the hypervisor. Uh, as I said, we monitor that through this daemon and in a directly connected fashion. And then we need to steer the traffic to the kernel in order to do this routing. So the routing to the actual uh, top of racks will happen at the kernel level. So what we need to do is to um, perform some sort of like proxy app or NDP for in the case of IPv6 in order to uh, perform this fallback to the kernel. And then the OVN demo will be responsible for having you know the necessary routes and uh, in some cases even like some ARP static entries on the host to be able to see this traffic in and out uh, uh, from and to OVN. The goal as well is like all the traffic which is inside the compute node doesn't necessarily need to go to the kernel so this would be uh, more efficient than other solutions that we have seen where uh, 
so all the local traffic to OVN will keep inside OVN. When it needs to go outside the hypervisor, it needs to go back to the kernel uh, and, and from there using ECMP routes to the NIC. But it of course comes with some limitations. Um, and this slide is trying to capture some of them. Being the most obvious one, uh, probably the fact that we cannot use overlapping IP addresses. So it's limiting the multi-tenancy, even though OpenStack has some mechanism like the address scopes to ensure that there's not going to be any overlapping uh, across the different tenants that belong to the same address scope. Uh, probably we can overcome that limitation with other solutions like eVPN, but uh, eVPN is more about stretching the L2 domain. So it will come at a cost as well, like traditional layer two problems that Mark mentioned earlier, like broadcast traffic, uh, size of our tables and these type of things. It will also uh, force the users into having eVPN capable upstream devices and configure them. It's probably harder to deploy. Uh, somebody needs to uh, be responsible for the VTAP endpoint creation, the VNI assignation and so on and so forth. So while well, this is something that we are not fully discarding today. Uh, this presentation is putting it aside and focusing on the uh, scenario that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Another limitation is definitely the use of accelerated data paths. SRV is definitely uh, something that cannot be used in, in this design because SRV is about skipping the hypervisor, so we cannot apply these techniques that we described to uh, full the traffic being routed in the kernel. Um, and this is definitely not going to work in this, in this design. OVS uh, DPDK will probably work, but the fact that we need to fall back to kernel routing to get out of the hypervisor uh, is probably going to impact up to some extent on its performance. And this is something that today we don't know about. So overall, whether you use DPDK or regular um, kernel data path, we don't know how this is going to affect performance. And it's something that we really need to, to take into account uh, when we are going to productize this type of solution. And now I'm handing over back to Mark. Please, Mark, take over. Thanks, Daniel, for that. So moving on to OpenShift. OpenShift as a, is at an earlier stage than OpenStack, for sure. And there are, uh, however, there has been some discussion within the community about the various use cases that would be applicable to uh, BGP with OpenShift. And there's a great document here, an enhancement proposal that was kicked off by Russell Bryant. I've linked in this presentation. Um, that discusses those use cases. And here I've, I've uh, added some of them, them to this slide. So for example, L3 redundancy for nodes, we can use BGP uh, to help distribute routes to nodes so that nodes can determine what their next hop is. And that could be used, for example, for load balancing or uh, redundancy purposes as well. We could have multiple routes outside of the, out from the node. Also, we can use BGP as a way to load balance traffic between services in an OpenShift cluster. Uh, typically in OpenShift, you need to use a, an external load balancer in order to do that. And maybe BGP could be a means of doing that. Also for exposing pods or services directly. So when a pod uh, or a service is made available in the cluster, we can use BGP to publish uh, an IP address and a route uh, to the rest of the network. Uh, for that uh, pod or service. And perhaps BGP could also be used as a way to interconnect different OpenShift clusters. And there's others in this presentation. And uh, we also want to hear from other people, uh, maybe you have some ideas in this respect and see what those use cases are. So I'd encourage you to reach out uh, to myself or Daniel, or uh, for example, commenting on the enhancement proposal. In terms of design, again, we're at very early days. We are starting to think about how we could integrate BGP uh, with OpenShift uh, using Oven. Uh, we want to follow a model very similar to what OpenStack is doing. And ideally, we would like to uh, reuse a lot of the components between the two, uh, two products. However, we'll have to wait to see if that is actually possible. 
Uh, and as well, we'd like to use FRR, free range routing, as the routing daemon on the, the node. Um, but the approach is very similar. We, we, we want to have, for we're potentially thinking about having some agent that would sit on the node listening to the oven um, databases, probably the southbound databases for any changing change in the oven configuration, and then using that to reflect those changes onto the uh, FRR daemon and that potentially can publish those changes out and also vice versa. So if a change has been made to uh, FRR, um, we can then use that to make some configuration change to oven as well. So just handing back over to Daniel. And just to wrap up, this slide is about the next steps, but really everything that we have been talking throughout the whole presentation is about the future because everything is on very early stages. So the main takeaway here is probably that we need to keep gathering more feedback from the users and from the community in order for us to best identify what are the main requirements, use cases, and what kind of challenges that we have ahead as well as we can uh, how we can help solving them on the more technical front some obvious things that come to my mind could be performance and scale testing uh, and other aspects such as you know avoiding extra hops by having a distributed north-south routing or come up with a proper api design that provides enough you know, flexibility for for consumers these are just examples. Uh, hopefully, this presentation helps gathering these feedback that uh, we have been talking through. And um, I want to thank everybody for attending and listening all the way to here. So thank you so much and see you next time.